Hi, everyone again. And uh, this time we will have Alexander Molek to present um, uh, a topic on modeling and aleatoric and epistemic uncertainty using TensorFlow and TensorFlow probability. Uh, trust me, I used to be able to pronounce it, right? Uh, <laughs> And uh, Alexander um, is um, the author of Sunday AI Papers, a linking weekly microblog on the latest advancement in NLP, casual inference, and more. All right, Alexander. Yeah, you can present now. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you for the introduction, Howard. Thank you so much. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Alexander Molak. Today's, uh, today's uh, talk topic is uh, modeling uncertainty in neural networks using TensorFlow and TensorFlow probability. Um, let me just uh, check if my if I can change my slides. Okay, so let's start with a brief agenda. We will start first with a quick uh, motivation: why even bother? Why to model uncertainty? Then we'll look at those two types of uncertainty that we have in the title: so aleatoric and epistemic uncertainty. We include we'll include a couple of uh, simple examples. Then we'll jump to a more practical aspect, and we'll look at TensorFlow probability library. And then we'll start modeling. So you can say we will start the party, right? So we'll look how to, uh, how to model aleatoric uncertainty, how to model epistemic uncertainty, both using TensorFlow probability and TensorFlow. And then at the end, I will show you also a simple trick how we can um, model epistemic uncertainty using plain, uh, plain TensorFlow. And at the end, hopefully, we'll have a couple of minutes for a Q&A session. Now, before we start, a five, five sentences about me. Uh, currently, I work uh, at Lingaro as innovation lead and machine learning researcher. I'm mostly interested in natural language processing, probabilistic modeling, and causal inference. And as Howard mentioned, I'm the author of Sunday AI Papers, which is a LinkedIn-based uh, microblog, where every week on Sunday, I review a couple of uh, the most recent, recent papers. Uh, uh, outside machine learning, I'm also interested in complex systems, uh, psychology and neuroscience, and it's a part of my academic background. And privately, I enjoy traveling with my wife, running, I appreciate good vegan food, and love to learn languages. Uh, at some point, we'll have a notebook here in this presentation. If you want to follow on Collab, for instance, you can use this repository and you will find the materials there. So it's PyData Global 2021. And my GitHub uh, name is A L X A N D R A L M L K. So it's my name and uh, surname without vowels. Okay. So why model uncertainty? Why we? Why even bother? Let's uh, start with some practical examples. First, imagine that you've built a gas price prediction system. You want to predict gas prices at some points in in time. Um, this is. A contrived example because you know gas prices might be a random walk, might be hard to predict, and so on. But let's imagine we can do it somehow. Uh, and from a classical deep learning model regression model, you will get a point, a point estimate. Now you might ask, okay, I have some point estimate for a given time point, but what is the variance against uh, around this estimate? So you might be interested in assessing how much this. Uh, how much this point estimate may vary, right? So in other words, is a question about confidence intervals. Another question you can, uh, you can ask yourself is that if you predict a couple of points in time, ahead in time, then you will get some kind of a tragic trajectory, right? And you might be thinking, okay, now there's one thing is this variance around those points, but another point is, how correct this trajectory itself is, right? And this is something that we'll look at uh, that we'll look at today a little bit a little bit later. The second um, the second case is uh, is a case of medical diagnosis system. Uh, you might have built a system like this, or maybe you're working on a system like this, and then the system at some point goes to production and predicts cancer diagnosis in, in patient in patient X. And the softmax score for this diagnosis is 0.9. So we can conceptualize this as a, a multi-class classification problem. And we might uh, ask a question, how sure are we that this diagnosis is, is correct? Uh, if it's 0.9, maybe we, you have three possible diagnoses in your system, and this is what you get. So most people naively would say that uh, the diagnosis A, we can be pretty sure about, about its correctness. 
but now you can start mm, modeling uncertainty in your system as well. And you might get something like this, where the area of this uh, blue rectangle are confidence intervals around the um, around your softmax scores. So this is you might you might ask like what how come right? But this is uh, this is a possible example, and I will sh show you one um, actual example from a real world system where a very similar thing happened. Okay, um, now let's talk briefly about those two types of uncertainty. So we talked about aleatoric and epistemic uncertainty. What does it actually mean? So aleatoric uncertainty, the name comes from a uh, Latin word, alia. It doesn't have anything to do with Hebrew word, alia, if you know Hebrew. Its original meaning is a joint bone, a little bone that people uh, used to as dice, right? So they were just throwing this and generating some random outcome. So it's a very, very early version of a pseudorandom number generator, in a sense. Another name for this kind of uncertainty, uh, perhaps uh, a simpler one, is data uncertainty. And, it's, uh, and we have this word data there because this type of uncertainty is inherently related to the data generating process. So one of the examples that you could think of here is uh, coin tossing. If your coin is fair, your perfect model will, will give you a uniform distribution over both outcomes that we can get here. Uh, but still, and this is the last point on the slide, this type of uncertainty cannot be reduced by adding more data. So even if you have a perfect model of, of a coin, of a fair coin, it doesn't help you. It, 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 adding more data won't help you in predicting another, um, the outcome of another, of another toss. So this is data uncertainty. The second type of uncertainty is epistemic uncertainty. Uh, the name ca comes from, from a Greek word, episteme, which stands for knowledge or understanding. It was a word used by early ph philosophers extensively like Aristotle and Plato. Uh, another name for this type of uncertainty, again, a simpler perhaps, a simpler name is model uncertainty. And this type of uncertainty might be reduced by adding more data because this is uncertainty of our model uh, parameters. And this uncertainty might be reduced if we add more data from the same distribution. Okay, let's uh, jump to something more practical now and let's think about TensorFlow probability. So our, the, the library that will help us modeling all those concepts. TensorFlow probability is a library that is separate from core TensorFlow, but it's a part of a TensorFlow ecosystem and it smoothly integrates with both TensorFlow and TFKRS. It's a comprehensive library with 16 sub-modules. And today in the context of um, modeling uncertainty in neural networks, we'll only focus on two of them, namely TFP distributions and TFP layers. So how do we import this? We just say TensorFlow probability. We mm, conventionally import this as TFP. And then those two sub-modules that I mentioned, so distributions sub-module and layers sub-modules, are conventionally um, assigned to, to an alias variable, which is TFD for distributions and TFPL for, for TensorFlow probability layers. Okay, so now we'll go and see some code. Um, you can follow using this link. Great, so, so then let's jump, to the, let's jump to the code. Yeah, and let's run this cell. So here we are running NumPy. We are importing NumPy, TensorFlow, TFP. We are uh, assigning those two uh, sub-modules to those convenience variables. And let's start with something similar. So basically, distributions, distributions is uh, something that is the most basic building block here. Let's build a normal distribution with mean 100 and standard deviation of 15. And let's see what we've got here. We've got an object. Uh, of a class TFP distributions normal. It has two, um, it has two attributes, match shape and event shape. Uh, They're important, but for the sake of today's presentation, we won't uh, pay too much attention to them. And let's see at some methods that distributions in TFP have. So first sample, okay? We can just sample it. This will return a TF tensor. Uh, we can transfer it, we can transform it into a NumPy array using method, a method called NumPy. 
and we can look at the samples. Do they look normal? Well, maybe not very normal, but more or less normal, let's say. Okay, another set of methods that are very, very important and will be very important for us are dot .prob and dot .log prob. These two methods um, return uh, PDF values. The first one returns PDF values of your distribution. So here we will say normal.prob. And the second one returns log PDF values. So these are not probabilities, at least in case of continuous variables. This is something you, it, it's, it's worth remembering, but these are PDF values, right? So they might be in some cases larger than, larger than one. Um, so let's see how this works. Uh, we got uh, the PDF value is the highest for, for, for 100, which is our mean. That's as expected. As, and as you can see, we have those symmetries here when we move one and two standard deviations below and above the mean. And the same is true for the log prop method, right? So this value is the highest one, and this is the mean of our normal distribution. Okay, let's start with our let's start with our uh, with our party modeling party. So we will start with modeling aleatoric uncertainty, and we'll use TFP layers, another module. Let's start with generating some data. It will be a linear data set, just like this, with some Gaussian noise and of standard, with standard deviation of 0.35. So let's generate this data and let's look at the scatter plot. So this is our data set. And now let's build a simple model. The simple model will be just a linear regression. So we have one dense layer with one, uh, one, one neuron and without any activation function mean squared error as our loss and optimizer, a very simple one, uh, just a stochastic gradient descent. We'll train this for 100 epochs, predict, and we'll plot our regression line. Okay, so this is our regression line. Is it perfect? I don't know, but I think it's reasonably well. And now let's try to do the same thing, but adding this aleatoric now layer, okay? So just to, uh, just to uh, remind you what aleatoric uncertainty stands for, it's, it's the type of uncertainty that is inherent to the data generating process. So if we look at this, we have some point estimates on this line and this is the best fit line. But here there is some variability around this line. So we will try to model this. So now we have this dense layer as in our, in our linear regression. But instead of just one neuron, we'll add two neurons here. Why? Because this dense layer won't be an output layer for, for, for us. It will be a layer that will parameterize a normal distribution. And we have independent normal here. And this normal distribution will have two parameters, mean and uh, standard deviation. So now, because this is the last layer that we have here, and this layer will return a distribution itself, we cannot use uh, mean squared error anymore, and we need our custom, and we need our custom uh, loss function for this. And for this problem, uh, computing a negative log likelihood is a good idea. Uh, as any you know, loss function in TensorFlow or Keras, it, it takes y true and y pred, so these two objects. And y pred is now this, which means an output of this layer, which is a distribution. So we take this distribution, we use a log probe method of this distribution, and we put our Y true, so our, predi our um, training data inside this distribution. And we add a minus side because we, are, we want to minimize instead of maximizing. Mm, and yeah, and let's train it. So this loss function will, will assess how good a model of the, our training data, the distribution, our distribution is, okay? And now let's see how it works. And now because we are learning distribution, we have a generated model. And this generated model can not only make a prediction for us, but can also generate data. So this is uh, the training data in blue and red. In red, you have uh, samples from our learned train distribution. And now we can also build confidence intervals for this, right? So of course, in case of, in a case of linear regression, you could also get those confidence intervals uh, from, from a classical, uh, classical model. 
Uh, but these uh, confidence, confidence intervals will also work for any nonlinear problem, whatever, whatever you want, uh, want to do. And I will show you an example in the, at the end. Okay, so now we, we're jumping into epistemic, epistemic uncertainty, and we'll use uh, variational inference to do this. Uh, epistemic uncertainty, as we discussed this before, is a type of uncertainty, a type of model uncertainty, where we want to model uncertainty over the parameters of our model, right? So here's one example of um, how this can be, how this can be uh, pictured. On your left, you can see a classical neural network where each wave is a, is a point estimate. And on your right, you see a, a neural network that models epistemic uncertainty. And each weight here is a distribution, right? So before we just had a distribution at the end here in the prediction layer, the last layer. Now we have distributions over all our weights inside the neural network. But the prediction will be a point estimate again. So to do this, we'll use a method that is called base by backprop. It has been introduced um, in 2015 uh, by Blundell et al. And we'll, we are using a, an estimate of, uh, of base theorem, an approximation of base theorem to, to compute our posterior. And there are three basic steps uh, to do this. So first we pick a prior density over our weights, which is here. And then we use data to determine the likelihood of data given those weights. And then we are trying to estimate the posterior finally using these quantities. And we'll use um, elbow or evidence lower bound to do this. Uh, we don't have time in this talk to go into theory, but if you're interested in this, under this link, you will find some information. Uh, here you can find some information about KL divergence. Mm and reparameterization trick, which are uh, building blocks of this whole method for variational base, okay? So let's get back to our linear data. Let's plot it. Now we are plotting two data sets, as you can see, because epistemic uncertainty is something that we can reduce by using more data. And we want to see this. So that's why we generated two data sets. Now, the whole process is a little bit more complex than it, it was for aleatoric uncertainty because we need to define prior and posterior functions explicitly and then pass them to the TFPL dense variation. So the structure of this code is as follows. Inside, we have a Keras model uh, that returns a distribution. This distribution, a prior, this, the prior distribution is not trainable. It's just a normal um, multivariate normal distribution. And then in posterior model, again, we have a normal distribution. This time it's trainable. And this layer here before returns a trainable variable that will be used to parameterize this distribution here. Okay. So yeah, so let's, um, let's see how this works. We'll build an ali the aleatoric model now. So we'll use a PFPL dense variational layer, as we mentioned before. And this layer has some similarities to a classical dense layers that we use in TensorFlow. It has one neuron because it's a simple uh, linear regression problem. The input shape is one dimensional. Again, we have one dimensional input. And then we have something that, something new. So we have make prior and make posterior functions. And we just pass our functions, but we don't call them here. We just pass them here. And then we need to add some weighting as well. This is a weighting for uh, kullback labor leibler divergence part uh, of our objective elbow that has to be normalized if you want it to be unbiased. Unfortunately, we don't have time to go into theoretical details of this, but you can find some information on the internet and I will provide you with some useful links. And here we are saying that we will uh, compute the kullback labor divergence um, approximately. So we could also, in our case, set, set this to true. And this uh, would analytically compute the KL divergence uh, between those uh, prior and posterior distributions, but we will set it to false because it's more interesting and more universal. Okay, so let's train this model. We'll train two models, one for 100 uh, observations, a smaller data set, and another one for 1,000 obs thousand observations for the, uh, the bigger data set. 
and we'll also plot our loss function. And when it's training, I will also tell you one, one more thing that I think uh, is interesting. So here again, we, as, as, as the loss function, we are using mean squared error. Why is that? Because this distribution, uh, this distribution estimates uncertainty over the weights, but not over the output, right? So output is, an, is, again, um, is again a scalar value, scalar value. So the loss function, as you can see, that the loss function for the smaller data set is more weakly, and the one for a larger data set is smoother. And now let's do 15 predictions. So now our model has weights as distributions, model as distributions. So each time that we make a prediction using this model, we will get slightly different estimates. Okay, and we will see this here. That's why we're doing this 15 times because we want to see those estimates. And as you can see, the model trained on a smaller data set gives us much more uncertainty when it comes to those line parameters, right? Both, um, both in the intercept and slope, right? While for 1,000 uh, for 1,000 data points, uh, our uncertainty is much much slower. Now, what we can also do, much much smaller, I wanted to say. Sorry. Uh, now, what we can also do, we can model both types of uncertainty and build a fully uh, fully probabilistic model. And I will just show you the architecture for this. We won't train it because it would take too long. Here we have TFPL variational again. Then we have another variational because this case will be um, nonlinear. So we want to model some nonlinearity here. And then we have at the end, uh, again, an independent normal uh, as, a, as, a, um, as our output distribution. So let me now switch back to the presentation and I will show you uh, what would be the outcome of this. So for this data set, this nonlinear data set, uh, this is something that we would get. So you can see that uh, we have many red lines here. Hopefully you can see this. And those many red lines are many different possible trajectories that come from our weight distributions inside the model. And these green lines, they mark uh, plus minus uh, uh, 50, uh, plus minus two uh, standard deviation or, or, or 95% confidence intervals. And you can see that for each prediction, we have a separate line now as well, right? So we have different trajectory for the, for, the, for, for, the, for the line, for the mean line, but also our confidence intervals are moving. And this is a fully probabilistic model. And I promised you at the end uh, that I will show you also a, um, a little trick how to, how to model epistemic uncertainty using plain TensorFlow. So this is a very simple trick. You could say uh, surprisingly, surprisingly simple. Um, and I will show you here a code from one of the projects that I was working on some time ago. This is a classification problem as opposed to what we've seen, what we've seen before. And as you can see, we have that only dense layers here and dropout layers here. And then this model would give us just a regular uh, set of, of predictions, but to switch it to uh, or, or transform it, uh, transform it to a model that, that models epistemic uncertainty, we can do one simple thing. So when we are generating predictions, we just set training to true. Uh, oh, setting training sorry, to true. Sorry yeah. to interrupt, but uh, we still have five minutes before the end of the session. Yes, yes, I'm aware of this. I'm, I have my, my clock, so, so it's like, I will just finish the slide and it will be time for our Q and A uh, session. So, so we are just uh, setting training to true, which leaves dropout uh, layers active, and we can make 1,000 predictions maybe and get a distribution now. So as you can see, uh, in this case, the model predicted correctly the, the true, right, true label, which was zero. Here is the probability predicted by a regular model. The red, uh, this red rectangle is a posterior distribution and the black line is the mean of the posterior. But here in this case, we had, uh, we had another prediction. The true label was one. Uh, model predicted something really close to one. So it could be probably like 
0.97. But as you can see, the distribution is very, very broad. So it's, it counts from zero to one. So the uncertainty here was really huge. And the mean is much, much lower than the probability predicted by the softmax score here. Okay, so that's, uh, that's all. And now we have a couple of minutes uh, for questions. Uh, thank you, Alexander, for the presentation. We have a few questions, but we only have three minutes, even though this yeah. is the last um, presentation of the session. So let's see if we can wrap them up quickly. The first mm -hmm. question is related to the path related uh, of the, okay, let's see, of the probability density function. Uh, Jan would like to know uh, the purpose of the session related to probability density function. Uh -huh. So the purpose uh, of describing this in the, in the presentation was that this method that evaluates PDF for a given input uh, is something that is useful for training, uh, training the models then, right? If we have this probabilistic layer as the, as, the, as the last layer in our model, then we can compute uh, log likelihood of, of the data. Uh, thanks to having this uh, distribution and 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 the ability uh, to evaluate the, the PDF or log PDF. Hopefully, this answered the question, and hopefully, I understood it well. Okay, so the next question, I think we can. All right, uh, we have two similar questions, uh, which is about uh, TensorFlow uh, comparison between TensorFlow and PyMC. Uh, where would you prefer TensorFlow over PyMC? Uh, EO is guessing that when you are testing for a linear model on the same account, can one does um, hierarchical modeling in TensorFlow? Uh, yeah, so, uh, so, so, so uh, the first question was, uh, when would you prefer one over the other? I think if you are working on, on, on a deep learning models and you build your code in TensorFlow and so on, then, then TFP is something that very, very smoothly integrates with TensorFlow. Uh, and that's the main reason, I, I would say. Um, the second question about hierarchical models, uh, I, I think you can build them as well. There are 16 submodules there. You have generalized linear models. There's really a lot, uh, a lot of stuff going on in, uh, in TensorFlow probability. And, and actually, I think everything that can be done in PyMC3 uh, can be done in TensorFlow probability as well. And that would be my best bet for now. Okay, so uh, one minute. So one last question. Uh, mm -hmm. How is the express um, from Matteo? How is the explicitly modeled epistemic uncertainty you have shown us different from the simple simply resampling of, of the original, predicting a regression line and relative co uh, confidence interval, and then measure epistemic uncertainty by looking at the variability in them? Yeah, so so this bootstrapping part, I, I think that's this is something that um, that we show at, at, at the end, right? That we've shown, show, shown that we've shown uh, in the end when you can just bootstrap your um, your predictions, but then you need this dropout, right? Otherwise, without dropout, your model is not probabilistic. So dro so this dropout, or Monte Carlo dropout, as it's called, is a way of approximating epistemic uh, uncertainty. Uh, I, hopefully, this answers your um, your question. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, and Alexander, thank you for participating, and all the other presenters, thank you for participating in Pad Data Global. And that's the end of uh, not just this presentation, but this session as well. Hopefully, everyone enjoys it. And yeah, uh, so yeah, see you in next sessions. Thanks a lot again. Bye -bye. Thank you so much. Bye bye.